Fuller Project is changing what it looks like to report about women by showing what hard-hitting, rigorous reporting about women looks like. We're telling stories about underreported issues, reproductive health and migration issues and sexual violence. And I know that we all share the same goal in that. But the journalism that we tell is messy, as complex as the women that we speak to. It's not a story you're going to get anywhere else. And to produce this groundbreaking, thoughtful journalism, further than raising awareness, could actually provoke change. My name is Sophia Jones. I'm global editor at The Fuller Project. I joined The Fuller Project several years ago because I wanted to be able to report on women and girls who potentially have impact and change women's lives. I had come across women in Afghanistan who had been imprisoned for sham virginity testing. This is controversial because there is no clinically proven method to determine virginity. And we wanted to see if it was happening in the United States. There was no reporting on this at all. What we found was that not only was it happening, there were no state or federal federal laws barring the practice in any way. I interviewed ER doctors, women's rights advocates, even plastic surgeons, along with women who said that they had been forced into these exams. The Fuller Project and Marie Claire Magazine together published a four-part series. Roughly a week after we published our investigation, T.I. the rapper came out and said that he routinely brought his daughter to check her hymen. This sparked national outcry and conversation. New York and California introduced legislation that could ban the practice of virginity testing or better protect women and girls. And in in the Philippines, state-run clinics that had been performing hymen exams stopped doing so. My name is Jessica Washington. I'm a journalist for The Fuller Project. We're talking to women who are often forgotten, who are left outside of the news cycle. I think that's why this journalism is really important. In reporting the story on Wisconsin mothers, it just wasn't something that I had gone into saying, I'm gonna do a story about childcare. But I spoke to this woman in Milwaukee. She was 19 years old, working at Wendy's, who had a four-year-old son and a six-month-old who had gotten COVID-19. And she was really trying to take care of her family. An example of how the deck has been stacked against certain people and kind of what are the ways that we can help alleviate that. I knew that she was going to be the focus of something important and valuable. The big thing for me is to make sure that I'm really listening to these people and I'm not painting them with one broad brush. People's lives aren't black and white and so our story shouldn't be either. Focusing on the mothers that I spoke to about their own experiences and treating them like the experts on their bodies and their situations make a story that I could be proud of sharing. I often hear back from women they felt seen in a way that they hadn't before that sometimes gives people the confidence to keep pushing forward. It's important for the people that I'm writing about to see some kind of benefit from the story. But if it can help hundreds of people, thousands of people, that's why we do our reporting. My name is Karin Redfern. I think of the Fuller Project as a team of journalists who are dedicated to investigating why women and girls are systematically discriminated against. I received a grant to do a series of stories investigating child marriage in Bangladesh. I teamed up with a photographer friend. It was really her idea to look at how child marriage acts as a precursor to sex trafficking. That was three years ago, and I've been looking into the societal structures and inequalities that make Bangladeshi girls so vulnerable to exploitation ever since. My priority was ensuring that the girls who I was speaking to were comfortable around me. So that spent spending hours every day watching the comings and goings of the brothel around us. Almost 50% of the women in the brothel had been married off while underage. Some were fleeing their husbands when they fell into the arms of their traffickers. Others were directly trafficked into prostitution by their husbands themselves. The discrimination that sex workers experience carries on after their deaths as well. They're not allowed to be buried in public ground. The brothels have built their own private graveyards, which are often overgrown swamps and areas of bushlands. We placed the first piece with LEK and it became one of the most read stories on their website that year. In June 2020, the US State Department acknowledged the link between trafficking and child marriage in Bangladesh. One sex worker was allowed to be buried in a public graveyard for the first time. NGOs have looked to our investigations to inform their programming and to use them as an indicator of an area where they need to focus more attention going forward. My name is Rika Sharma Rani. All too often, women's issues are reduced to glossy fashion magazines. I want to change what it looks like to report about women. 
We partnered with the Montgomery Advertiser on a series about human trafficking. One of the major trafficking thoroughfares in the country runs through Alabama all the way down to Florida. There was this pervasive belief that trafficking was not something that happened in the state. Our whole team had gone to Alabama for a team retreat. We met with the executive director of a local human trafficking organization. I reached out to the Montgomery Advertiser. That's how the partnership came about. My partner on this story was Melissa Brown, and she has deep ties to the community, including with local law enforcement. And as Fuller Project, we had really invested resources in trafficking reporting that built credibility with our sources. I spoke with a woman named Clara who had started being trafficked at the age of 14 and it was an illustration of what trafficking looks like in the United States. The series has become a key resource when myths and misconceptions about trafficking start to bubble up. This piece will debunk those misconceptions. My name is Louise Donovan. Working for the Fuller Project, I'm able to tell stories about women across Kenya and place them in publications that perhaps would overlook these issues in the first place. One of the most important stories that I've worked on was about Kenyan domestic workers trapped in the Middle East because of the coronavirus pandemic. They'd either lost their jobs or they weren't getting their salaries paid by their employers and they couldn't get home and they were in a dire situation. So I've been working on the issue of migration and domestic work and I had a deep source network connected to the domestic workers union. I was put in touch with a woman called Apasaki. She was locked in a room with eight other women one of these women was actually chained to the wall. And they are holding our passport. That's the problem. Nobody could know the problem we are going through. It was at that point that I knew that we had a big story. We verified her location, took the reporting to the New York Times. So after the story was published, Saudi officials took the women into a safe house. Several New York Times readers helped the women with passport and visa issues. This story led to more reporting on the issues of domestic workers. I profiled the head of the Domestic Workers Union in Kenya for the Daily Nation. Every woman I spoke to is now back at home. Apasaki was reunited with her family. I gave up, I thought that I wouldn't go home, but finally God has listened to my prayers. They told me that this story and the repercussions of this reporting had saved their lives. 